Next up, our keynote, Heather Andrus is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Product Innovation for Radius Product Development. Now, Heather's going to be speaking about want, what, if you want extraordinary results, you need to think like a designer. So first of all, thank you, Wendy. Um, I really appreciated your um, challenge to talk about something that we're proud of and passionate about. And this is something I'm extraordinarily passionate about. And this is how to think like a designer. So we think of designers as being very creative. We are, um, as women in technology, maybe a little bit more logical. So how do we embrace this creativity and be able to think like a designer? I'm also um, really encouraged that everyone here is so open to learning, because what we're going to talk about is a process for being able to be creative and how we might learn to do that and embrace our inner creativity. Can we go to the slides in the front? OK. So just so I know who's in the room, um, who here is an engineer, some kind of tech? Oh, awesome. <laughs> wow. Who here is uh, maybe involved in tech, but in a more marketing or HR role? OK. Fantastic. Fantastic. Lots of fun. So this is going to be perfect. Um, so one of the good things about women in technology is that we have been on the rise, right? There's been a lot of work, a lot of talk around STEM and women in STEM, and we've been making great inroads. And that's thanks to all of you here. Um, having gone to uh, engineering school in the 80s, I know that that wasn't easy. However, um, does anyone know Dan Pink, A Whole New Mind? We are in the age, the conceptual age, right? So we have come out of the information age, and now we're moving into the conceptual age. So how do we take those skills that we have learned, right, those analytic, technical skills, and enter the conceptual age? So um, I went to my undergrad at MIT, and uh, I majored in computer science and engineering. Uh, but I also majored in psychology and pre-med. And so with my little geeky brain, I'm like, well, what, what does this mean? What's the difference between men and women? You know, so it turns out there are significant differences between ma male and female hemispheric rivalry and dominance have been established. Male brains have significantly better global and rivalry efficiency between the hemispheres, whereas female brains possess considerably better local efficiency within the RHS. I quote. What does that mean? So left brain, right brain, right? Your left brain is your logical side. It's about math and science. It's about the present and the past. It's about being rational and detail-oriented. Everything that we have worked for many, many, many years to master. The right brain, right? The right brain is about intuition, imagination, the future, imagining possibilities, opening things up. What can it be, right? Do I get it? Do I understand you? So we've worked really hard on the left brain, but as we enter this conceptual age, we need to also embrace our right brain. So quick test for everybody, OK? We're going to go through these real fast. Um, everybody yell out the color. OK? Red, blue, yellow, purple, green. <laughs> All right, was that easy? No. <laughs> I was really impressed. So uh, left brain wants you to read the word. Your right brain wants you to say the color. That's the, the dissonance going on between those two halves of your brain, OK? So. We've got these two halves. They're in dissonance. What do we do? Enter design thinking. Design thinking is a process for being able to engage your logical brain and your creative brain in solving problems. And it works a little bit like this. You go through a stage of opening up, right, in understanding, gaining empathy, understanding meaning, listening to people. And then you go through a stage of what does all that mean? And then you open back up and you ideate. You think about, how do I solve these problems? What are the problems that I can bring my creativity to bear on? And then you go and implement. And we, as women in technology, often go to that last bit, right? Like, here's the problem. I will solve it. Go. 
right? And the solution that I came up with, by the way, is the only one because things are black and white. <laughs> so this process works extraordinarily well on problems that seem too small. Tiny little problems, what's the big deal? Problems that might seem too big, overwhelming. And then problems that we didn't even know about, right? Uncovering unmet needs for people that we're creating things for. So an example of a place where this was used, the US Air Force. So the US Air Force has around 170,000 soldiers. And the US Air Force found that their soldiers were less fit. In fact, some of their soldiers were mustering out because of this. So how do you change fitness, wellness, and nutrition behaviors for 170,000 soldiers? That's a big problem. So um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense calls this the burning platform, right? Obesity in the US has risen. It has also risen for our soldiers. In 2030, they estimate that 64% of people will not qualify for the military due to their weight. 64%. Unbelievable. So what do we do about this problem? So we dug in, right? This first phase of trying to solve this overwhelming problem was go out and learn things. Learn who these people are. Learn how they live. This is uh, Beale Air Force Base. This is their website. And one thing that, of course, the military stresses is fitness. And they have unbelievable resources. In fact, I was looking this up yesterday. I'm like, they have amazing pools. You can go. They have this uh, car club that you can go to. You can go bowling. They have an arts and crafts room. Um, you can get outdoor adventure equipment and just take it and go out and have an adventure with your family. Golf. I'm like, I'm, I'm in, right? But they're still having this problem. Even though they have this cultural focus, they have the facilities that allow people to be fit. What's going on? Let's dig deeper. Well, of course, if we're going to solve a problem, we can't think about it the same way. It's clear that the facilities and the amazing um, ability to go be fit is not having the impact that it needs to have. What can we think about in a different way? So we started observing. Well, and, and one of the things that we saw was that there's fast food, right, on base, and it's very convenient. So like the rest of America, this provides an easy way to get food, but it's not the healthiest way. All right, that's a good observation. Good, good for us. But we talked to people. So we talked to 22 different soldiers, different part, uh, aspects of life, whether they were new recruits, whether they had been in the military for a long time, folks who had come back from being deployed. And in the process of talking to them, we realized, you know what? These are not just soldiers. In fact, these are family members. These are brothers. These are comrades, these are fathers, they're partners. These soldiers are in fact part of a whole network. And it's not just about the soldier, it's about this network. So how do we create a system that supports this network? Because that's how we're gonna be able to create change. So this is one example of a group of National Guardsmen who um, created their own community. So these National Guardmen, they're called the Barley House Wolves. They learned hurling. So who's heard of hurling? <laughs> wow, <laughs> OK. So they formed a hurling club when they came back from deployment to create a way to be warriors, right? A way to have community together. So we wanted to leverage this insight and say, how do we allow soldiers to be able to do this for each other, right? It's that community that they created. So we took all of these inputs, and we went out to our stakeholders. We took 25 of the folks from the military who were sponsoring us on this project. We spent four days together. We came up with lots and lots and lots and lots of ideas. So empathy, showing people what's happening, right? what's really happening, and collaboration, the ability to bring in all different points of view. right? It allows people to be creative, to think in a different way than they've thought before. So the results of this uh, was, this is part of Operation Live Well. It was piloted on, it's called the Healthy Base Initiative. It was piloted on 14 bases. And there's some easy things, right? Better food choices, fruits and vegetables, access to workout equipment in uh, previously, there might have been a single gym in the center of a base, but how do we make little micro gyms that are easier to access? 
but how do we help people form relationships, right? So maybe there's an online portal that allows folks to find a workout buddy. If you can imagine getting posted to a new base, you're single, you don't have a family, you like to work out, or you know that you want to work out, how do you locate a buddy? Well, an online portal that says, hey, I'm looking for someone to work out with. Can you work out with me? A way to organize events easily for you and for your community, right? A way to reach out to your community. So this is a hike that uh, Airman Mike organized, right? It's a parent-child forest hike. Airman Mike likes to do that. He wants to reach out into his community and say, hey, anybody want to go with me? And of course, being able to bring in the rest of the family. So this is an initiative based on um, helping children learn how to cook and make healthy food choices. So the entire family, the entire community is involved in healthy living. Left brain, right brain, right? The ability to look beyond the obvious answers and find new solutions. So um, I want to talk about my personal journey with design thinking. Uh, I'm a very classic engineer. I'm the one on the left. Uh, these are my four brothers and my sister. And I grew up in a very small town. This is the Burger Barn town, uh, Roy, Utah. And by the way, it was featured on diners, drive-ins, and drives. Oh my gosh. The burgers are really, really, really good, I promise. We used to um, go sell t-shirts door to door, and we got to have lunch at the burger bar afterwards. Very cool. That was the treat. And um, when I was in eighth grade, I decided, oh, I want to become an engineer. I'm good at science and math. I'm not so good with people. That seems like a good, good thing to do. And um, I looked up in a book. I'm like, oh, electrical engineering, that's the hardest kind. That's what I'll do. Oh, MIT is the hardest school. Good, I'll go to MIT. Yeah. So I proceeded to apply to MIT, and I got in. And my grandmother, this is uh, Eva Connell, my grandma, when I got in, she said, oh my gosh, honey, you got into the Montana Institute of Trucking. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> For real. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma. Um, so she and my mother were not so excited to find out that MIT is, in fact, in Boston. So uh, this is MIT. And I just want to point out, I came from here. I went to here. <laughs> And uh, I was not so bright, so book smart, not street smart, right? And um, there were a couple things. First of all, note the address here, 5291 South, 1900 West, Roy, Utah, and you arrive at a building. Turns out, it, when you go to MIT, they give you the address of 77 Mass Ave in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you arrive at a building, sort of, right? You arrive at an enormous campus. <laughs> So I arrived with four boxes, and um, I was convinced that, for some reason, Boston would not have stores. So I stocked up on baby powder and toothpaste and deodorant. So I had these four boxes stuffed with supplies. I'm good for my first year till I go home for the summer. So I have my boxes, and I'm at 77 Mass Ave, right? And I'm like, OK, now what <laughs> do I do? So I found someone, they said, Oh, yes, if you go to building 10, they'll tell you where your dorm's going to be. So I'm like, oh, building 10, OK. So <laughs> I actually looked for a street view, but the campus is too big. So my journey went from 77 Mass Ave over to the MIT chapel, where I realized I wasn't going towards building 10, back to 77 Mass Ave with my four boxes of baby powder, might I know. <laughs> And then through something called the Infinite Corridor. Any MIT people here? Yes, the Infinite Corridor, right, with my four boxes. And then on to East Campus. So I arrive at East Campus, which was going to be my dorm, uh, just for orientation. And I realize I'm on the fifth floor walk up. So I get up to the fifth floor walk up. <sighs> OK, I'm good. It's all good. And I realize that I've been housed in Black Bemis. So Black Bemis, for those of you who are not aware, is painted black. This is a picture of Black Bemis. So I arrived with my boxes of baby powder from Roy, Utah, to Black Bemis. Well, I managed to settle in. I found an all-women's dorm uh, with my own room and decorated and did all that kind of stuff. Perfect. All right. Now, my next task was to choose my major, right? So um, I looked at the grid, right? These are all the majors. 
And just so you don't think the MIT women are total geeks, there is color. Right? So I cho chose course six. There are 629 people majoring in course six. Course six, by the way, is electrical engineering and computer science. And I got my list of classes. So sophomore year, I'm going to take 6002. So course six, 6002, all good. Um, and at this time, there were 30% women undergrads at MIT, really amazing percentage. So I show up for 6002 in room 10250. It was at 2.30. There were four women in my class of 70. <laughs> Lots of fun. Really different now. So I graduated. I moved to Silicon Valley. I got my dream job at Oracle as a programmer, programming DOS. DOS, right? <laughs> I would launch products with a floppy disk, and I would slide it under my boss's door and go home. There we go. A little bit different now. But I found I had my dream job, my dream education. I'd achieved everything. My little right brain was, was tingling. Like, there's got to be more. There's got to be more to this than just this. So what do we do about it? Enter the Stanford Product Design Program. So Stanford Product Design um, is the place where I learned the process of design thinking. And for my little left brain, the idea that there's a process to being creative is incredibly empowering, right? So it is a process. It is repeatable. You can do it over and over. And you can do it with all of your friends. It's really fantastic. So this is my passion. This is what I really, really love to do. This is the process. Empathy, the first step. Understanding other people outside of yourself. How many times have you been in a room and people say, I think this, I think this, I think this. We're making things for other people. Let's talk to those people, right? Let's create an empathy for them. And we as women are really good at that. That's one of our skills. It's an innate skill. And then go into definition. Get to use your left side of the brain, right? Define and narrow down. And then again, open up the possibilities. What might the solutions be for this? And then again, go and launch. Create something for the world. So my most recent journey is with Chable. So Radius is an innovation company which was acquired by Jable uh, three years ago. So who's familiar with Jable? So Jable is a contract manufacturing company. It is the most left brain place you can get to. <laughs> it's about $18 billion, right? And what would an $18 billion company want with a tiny little innovation and development consultancy with five offices? Left brain, right brain, right? It's this idea of the conceptual age. And how do you bring those two together in a really powerful way? So here's an example of a project we did. This is the Coca-Cola Freestyle Machine. There were about 14 people, different organizations involved in this machine. It's very complex. Um, Radius was lucky enough to be given the mechanical engineering. So for the mechanical engineers, do we have any? Mechanical engineers. So you guys recognize this, right? Exploded. There's some parts. They're hard to put together. There were some light pipes. It was complicated. Um, it turns out that um, syrup is um, highly corrosive, lots of fun. So how do you put some gaskets in place with a highly corrosive substance? We went and found materials. All these really fun challenges, right? Very, very left brain. Hard, but that's what we're here for. But we want to engage the right brain. So we went out and talked to people. And not just people who were going to drink soda, but the people who were going to use the machine. So these are some folks from Five Guys. And you've all been there, I'm sure. Five Guys fans? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These guys are really, they make some delicious burgers. And I, by the way, I realized last night that all of my stories are around burgers. I don't know why. But <laughs> <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> so these guys make some delicious burgers. And you know, we watched them with the machine. This is where all the syrups go in, very organized. You slide these little cartridges in, easy peasy. Oh. But you open the top up, and you look at all the valving to move all of this highly corrosive fluid, by the way, from one place to another. And these guys have to clean all that every single night. Every night. Not good. Right? That's hard. And these guys are not trained in pulling apart valves and making sure that fluidics are running correctly. These are five guys, guys, right? So we spent a lot of time developing a fluidics system 
that is easily, easily cleanable so that in the field, these folks would be able to clean the machine every night and maintain it properly. An insight that we wouldn't have known about unless we had gone out and spoken to them. The result, Coca-Cola Freestyle is expected to bring in approximately $121 billion, right? Adoption is such an important part of that, the ability to maintain the machines. So left brain, right brain bringing both of those to bear and creating amazing products, amazing experiences for people in the world. So let's talk a little bit about the journey to becoming right-brained. Human female, so the other statement, this is actually exactly the same statement. The other one was a left brain version of it. This is the right brain, right? <laughs> Human females tend to be higher than males in empathy, verbal skills, social skills, yay. <laughs> We have a natural leg up in design thinking, especially those of us who've spent so much time training our left brain. Empathy, collaboration. Those are the keys to thinking like a designer. Imagining yourself as somebody else. What do they go through? What is their life like? And then being able to collaborate with a wide variety of people so you get many different points of view. This is um, my daughter, Lauren. She's 12, going on 17, and um, she allowed me to borrow her ukulele. So I don't play the ukulele, she plays the ukulele. And she, um, she gave me a little cheat sheet for the notes, so I have to look at the cheat sheet. So, um, here we go. Who knows what note that is? Anyone, perfect pitch, anybody? Anyone? <laughs> a, C, that was a G, actually, according to my cheat sheet. <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> that was C, that was C, that was really good. So um, perfect pitch, really interesting. Turns out that perfect pitch, one in 10,000 people have perfect pitch, so I'm impressed that, you, that uh, some people here got it. That's 0.01% for our left brains, right? Now, it turns out that if you're exposed to music at an early age, about 14% of people have perfect pitch. And if you are a speaker of a tonal language such as Mandarin, about 75% of people have perfect pitch. So this is learnable, right? The ability to engage with your creative brain is a learnable thing. Now, because we've spent so much time thinking on the left side of our brain, sometimes that right side can be atrophied, right? So design thinking gives you a process for waking it back up, for engaging in creativity, for learning how to do that again. And I want to encourage everybody here to engage in creative exercise for you and for your community, for women, right? And I just want to close with this, that technology, technology is as much about the people that it serves as it is about those little bits and bites, those details that we sweat through every single day. And we as women have a natural ability and are uniquely situated to make sure that both the bits and the bites and the people that we serve are well served.